shrinking for the second straight quarter. That means the recession is well underway. As we say good morning, I'm Bill Hemmer. A ton to get to today, so we waste no time. How we you will doing? waste no time at all. I'm Dana Perino. This is America's Newsroom, and this is exactly what the Biden administration anticipated yes. would happen. They tried to get in front of it with messaging, but the numbers are the numbers. The Commerce Department announcing GDP shrank by 0.9%, mm -hmm. and you know that is then the second consecutive quarter which means that there is and, a recession. And there's been this ongoing debate. you got to get out Merriam-Webster's dictionary. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're going to define recession for you. Here's the bottom line. The Biden economy is shrinking as the Fed unleashes rapid-fire rate hikes to try and stave off the highest inflation we've seen in more than 40 years. Let's get right to it. Maria Bartiromo joins us now. Maria, good morning to you. Go ahead and give us the news because they projected 0.5% on the positive side. The number was a negative 0.9. We missed it by a point and a half, right? Yes, that's right. Good morning to you both. We are now in recession, uh, and we can confirm that because it is two quarters straight of contraction. The uh, economy shrank in the second quarter uh, by nine tenths of a percent, on top of shrinking in the first quarter by 1.6 percent. Now, so far, all of the commentary that I'm hearing is uh, talking about a shrinking of the economy, but the good news for the economy is that job growth has has stayed strong. And that was why some people were questioning, well, maybe it's different this time. It's hard to believe that job growth can be up to 300,000 in one month when, in fact, you are in a recession. What's different this time is that we did have an inventory buildup. In other words, a lot of companies were holding on to inventory because of those supply chain shocks. Uh, when they were able to get the supplies that they needed, they were built up and weren't able to sell them. So at the end of the quarter, companies were complaining that they had too much inventory and they needed to mark stuff down. And that led to some expectations, well, maybe inflation is peaking. I see no evidence that inflation is peaking right now. We are at 40-year highs. However, we did see oil prices come off of the highs of the year in the month of July. So maybe in July we get a better, more manageable consumer price index than the current 9.1 percent that we have right now. There is reason to believe inflation comes down in July. But but it can go right back up again. The bottom line here is the economy is troubled. Don't forget, three million fewer people are working today than before the pandemic. We are producing less oil than before the pandemic, and we are no longer in growth mode. We are in a shrinking mode. The economy got smaller, not just in the first quarter, but the second quarter as well. Dana, you just mentioned the White House tried to manage this, get in front of the number, tell us a recession is not a recession. We all know what a recession is. This is what economists have counted on for as long as I've been covering this, and that's 30 years. Two quarters of contraction is a recession. No matter how you feel about it or no matter what you want to call it, people are feeling pressure. They're, they're paying 35% more for a dozen eggs than they were last year. They're paying 18% more for meat and fish than they were last year. And so those costs are creating what we call demand destruction. A housing is probably going to be the area that you want to focus on most because you had mortgage rates now at 5.5%, and that has put a sharp, sharp uh, uh, dent in what we were looking at to be a very strong housing market. Bottom line, this is what the Fed wants. That's why the Fed is slamming on the brakes on this economy with 75 basis point hikes two times in a row. We will likely see rates continue to go higher and an economy continuing to slow. So that, that's so helpful. And I wondered, I wanted to ask you about that Fed rate hike yesterday. So the White House will come out today, no doubt, and the president will speak at 2.15 today. And one of the things that they will say is that recession announcements are backwards looking. It's uh, that's looking backwards. And they will try to say that going forward, things look better. Do they have a case to make there when the Fed just did this yesterday and we won't have the effects of that for a few months? No, I don't think so. If anything, we are looking at a GDP that sometimes people feel is backward looking, but there's every reason to believe that this gets worse because of the sting of inflation. I just spoke on Mornings with Maria to Nick Timoros from the Wall Street Journal, Ken Rogoff, as well as Kevin Hassett. 
Ken Rogoff said he is expecting things to get worse in the second half of the year. We are watching all of these numbers because the Federal Reserve is watching to see how aggressive they are going to be. There's now a 22 percent probability that they raise rates again by 75 basis points in September. Well, that's lower than the chances that we were looking at before this number. We are still talking about rates going higher. And as you watch rates go higher, your borrowing costs go higher, and the rest of the world get impacted by that, there's now talk of government debt defaults across the world. Mm -hmm. Europe is probably going to go into recession sooner than the United States is because Europe has a whole gas problem as well because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So once we see Europe go into a recession, that reverberates as well. Sure Remember, does. this is not a decoupling. We are all in this situation together, and the global economy is under pressure. So I would expect things to worsen in the second half of the okay. year, Maria, unfortunately. Really appreciate the analysis on the spot and all that. Midterms are three months away. You've got Democrats on the Senate late yesterday proposing raising taxes on American yeah. companies. We're going to see how all this plays yeah. out very soon. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, guys. Jackie Heinrich has reaction from the White House, where officials, they've spent days, Jackie, trying to downplay this report, uh, but the news turned out maybe even worse than they thought it would be. Yeah, Dana, it certainly looks like they had an idea this was probably coming. The White House has been trying to get out ahead of these numbers uh, since at least last week in both blog materials through the Council of Economic Advisors and also officials going on television, uh, basically saying that uh, a second quarter of negative growth would not, in their view, constitute a recession because the economy is healthy in other ways. But as recently as last night, a senior administration official also went so far as to say this isn't even just just the position of the administration, that is the technical definition. So prepare to hear a lot more of this. If the technical definition is two quarters of contraction, you're saying that's not a recession? That's not the tech. No. That's not the technical definition. In terms of the technical definition, it's not a recession. The technical definition considers a much broader spectrum uh, of data points. That is not the actual definition of a recession. It is a significant contractionary period over a few months. The RNC has been circulating some of Biden's own economic advisors as recently as last May, re, or excuse me, defining recession the old-fashioned way, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, they put out a statement that we're citing some comments from those folks. And while the White House is now rejecting that definition, they're also refusing to lay out what criteria exactly would constitute a recession. And they're denying at the same time that they are redefining the word. We all understand a recession to be two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in a row. And then you have White House officials come up here to say, no, 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 that's not what a recession is. It's something else. How is that not redefining recession? Because that's not the definition. So we will likely hear from the White House shortly. Right now, the president is on the phone uh, with Chinese President Xi Jinping. I'm told tariffs are part of the discussion here. Uh, but, but as of about an hour ago, the president still had not made up his mind on whether or not uh, he would lift tariffs on Chinese-made goods. The current rate's about 19.3 percent, as opposed to around 3 percent on goods from other countries. There has been and continues to be a split within the White House over what to do and how much it might bring down prices. And there's also concern that if he were to lift these tariffs, it could have a huge impact on union workers. So waiting details uh, for the readout of that call. Dana. Right, so, so much going on at the White House today. Thank you for taking us through that, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. A couple of things. Reminders on Monday, President Biden said, I don't think we're going to see a recession. Yesterday, um, Jerome Powell said, you tend to take the first GDP reports with a grain of salt. Oh, really? Right. Now, a lot of this is how you feel. I, I bought a sandwich in New York yesterday. Just sandwich, no chips, no fry, no salad. Eleven dollars and thirty-one cents. Did you get extra tomato or something? <laughs> no, I, I got it. was a good sandwich, but that's no, it's eleven dollars and thirty-one cents. You know, you're, you're, we are heading into August, which is a month where people start to have their vacations, but think about the semester ahead for their kids. You got school fees you got to pay for. You got the food that you have to get ready for their school lunches and things like that. And all of those costs, like getting the dorm room ready, everything is costing more. So people are feeling it, regardless of the technical definition, though it is important. Mm -hmm. I think the feeling in the country is why you have so many people say the country's going in the wrong direction.
And we are going to have much more on this with Jared Bernstein. He is the White House Council of Economic Advisors Chief, and we will talk to him in our next hour. Looking forward to getting to that. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken now suggesting on Wednesday that a prisoner swap with Russia is on the table. The administration trying to secure the release of Paul Whelan and the WNBA star Brittany Griner now on trial in Moscow. We put a substantial proposal on the table weeks ago to facilitate their release. Our governments have communicated repeatedly and directly on that proposal. The president is prepared to make tough decisions um, if it means the safe return of Americans. Well, get this. Any deal with Moscow will include convicted arms trafficker Victor Bout, dubbed the merchant of death. He's accused of fueling some of the world's bloodiest conflicts, especially in Africa. He was captured in a DEA sting in 2008 after a decade-long manhunt. Bout was found guilty of conspiring to kill Americans. That was 12, 11 years ago, 2011, serving a 25-year sentence. Is this the right deal? Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo joins us with a reaction a bit later today. We'll talk to him there. Also, Bill, chilling new details emerging about the Kavanaugh assassination suspect. An FBI search warrant reveals that 26-year-old Nicholas John Roski told others that he was going to, quote, stop Roe v. Wade from being overturned by removing some people from the Supreme Court. The documents also include the suspect's Google history in the days leading up to the attempt. They include searches for assassin skills, most effective place to stab someone, and Reagan assassination attempt. A bill expanding protections for Supreme Court justices was signed into law by President Biden last month and certainly needed to be. Well, meanwhile, the president trying to keep China's Xi Jinping in check. In uh, fact, they're talking right now by telephone, as Jackie just reported. Can he make his point clear or will it get lost in the call, right? Former Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe on that coming up momentarily, Dana. And the Democrats' climate agenda, well, might be saved by the bell. Senator Joe Manchin strikes a surprise deal to revive the biggest climate spending push in U.S. history. Some say it's just a distraction tactic for the midterms. And a reminder, we're just about 100 days away from those midterms. President Biden continues to turn a blind eye to his, well, his um, low poll numbers. Can he ignore the alarming level of doubt from within his own party? we got a great panel. Rove and Messina, they'll debate it. Coming up. Do you support the president in his re-election bid? I'm working on my own election, and that's all I'm focused on right now. I can't reach 911. I can't reach nobody, no troopers. There's no help in sight. I can't get to them. Nobody can get to them. Water rescues and evacuations are underway in eastern Kentucky as heavy rains lead to flash flooding in the region. Let's go to Fox Weather correspondent Will Nunley. You're in Hazard, Kentucky. Will, how bad is it this morning? I'll tell you what, this is an ongoing emergency situation. Evacuations continuing to happen, and here's why. Normally peaceful, quiet drainage ditches like this are turning into powerful channels that are eating away the roads. Eating away part of the embankment here, and this is a only one way in and one way out street, and this is being repeated around what we're seeing here in Hazard. These homes, about six of them, are inches away from falling into this rushing water and breaking apart. I just spoke with Mary, who lives in this home. She describes what happened here overnight. How big of a deal is this? Is it the whole county dealing with this? Do you feel like it's just kind of downtown Hazard, or how big of a problem is it? Well, I've been out once, and um, I know that some people's houses have been torn to, and some people's houses are floating away. Um, this is my trailer right here, and the whole backyard is gone now, so. There are dozens and dozens of people facing these evacuations at this hour because these homes are so close to falling into this water. Meanwhile, they're trying to keep the highways open. Hazard police say they're working mudslides and rock slides that are happening on Highway 80, trying to keep those clear so that emergency resources can continue to pour in. And guys, it's still raining. This is far from over. All right, well, uh, we wish them the best. Thank you for the update. A lot of rain there. Meanwhile, President Biden on the phone right now with President Xi. We expect this call to go several hours. Tensions simmering after Beijing ramped up threats amid House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's planned visit to Taiwan. A Chinese official warning, quote, if the U.S. side insists on making the visit and challenges China's red line, it will be met with resolute countermeasures. John Radcliffe, former director of national intelligence under President Trump. And, sir, welcome back to our program Morning, here. Bill. Nice to see you. Michael Waltz told us yesterday she's got to go. If she doesn't, that shows weakness right now. In Brazil yesterday, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, however, countered with this. Listen carefully. Here it is. 
I'm concerned, and you've heard me say this before, about the uh, aggressiveness of the PRC and, uh, and the kinds of things that we've been seeing uh, in the region uh, lately. Uh, and so I think we have to be vigilant. I, I get it, but I mean, is that a statement of weakness or is he, is he being rightfully careful, sir? Well, I don't think you can dismiss uh, China's threats as, um, you know, as idle threats at this point. There's a lot at stake for President Xi Jinping. Um, you know, he is on the verge of a unprecedented third term uh, later this fall. Uh, yeah. Some would say a president for life term. And so, you know, the, the visit here is something that I think that he and the Chinese would view as humiliating or degrading or embarrassing to the projection of one China and China strength or, or supportive if an American Speaker of the House landed uh, supportive of uh, Taiwan's independence. So, you know, they have a lot uh, at stake. And I think that uh, the threats that they're making are because they want to dissuade the speaker from going. But I think at this point, the way it's played out very publicly, Bill, is I do think that she has to go. If she does not go, it really sends the message that the Chinese government, not the American government, gets to decide America's national security posture and concerns in the South China Seas. And I think that would be disastrous. The problem for Nancy Pelosi, though, Bill, is that this is no longer just a diplomatic issue. It's become a political issue, and there's a political calculation involved here. Um, you know, uh, Joe Biden has earned uh, the reputation has backed down Biden from, you know, backing down to the Taliban in uh, in Afghanistan, in Ukraine. He encouraged Zelensky to back down. He offered him a ride out of town on the second day of the Russian invasion. And now he has publicly backed up uh, China's assertion that, that uh, Nancy Pelosi shouldn't go. So, you know, as lawmakers uh, head to the uh, August recess and go home for six months of campaigning, if Nancy Pelosi heeds Joe Biden's uh, recommendation that she not go, I think you're going to hear Republican lawmakers say, look, the Biden White House won't stand up to America's number one national security threat, China, and a democratically controlled uh, Congress won't stand up to him either. Republicans need to be in charge of Congress uh, to stand up to, to the China yeah. threat. And I think that if she makes that decision, there's a, there's a political calculation there as well. Yeah, a very interesting answer there. L listening to some experts, they have suggested if you're in the region, say you're in Japan, you, made the, you make the side trip. But, but this has been so publicized. Do you think the speaker wanted it that way, or do you think someone ratted her out? No, I think uh, I think you know the, the think the speaker would love nothing more than and and I think ultimately I what I think she'll probably do is say this was never actually on my itinerary was something we've talked about now it's become this dust up and I I, I suspect that she won't go. Uh, I think that would be a mistake for the reasons that we've talked about. But again, the way that it's pay, played out very publicly, you know, and I think that unfortunately. Uh, Joe Biden contributed to that by by publicly saying, look, uh, we don't think she should go. The military doesn't want her to go. Uh, and and China doubled down on that. Remember, you know, Chinese officials on Saturday said she shouldn't go. And they came out on Monday and said, not only should she not go, but if she goes, we're going to take some provocative. We may take some provocative action. And so it's escalated in a very public way. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's become more than just a diplomatic issue now. It's a political no, no one. No doubt. John Radcliffe, thank you for your time. Appreciate the input. We'll talk you bet. again. Thank you, sir. Republicans are downplaying a deal that Senator Joe Manchin made with fellow Democrats on a vastly scaled back version of Build Back Better. Republicans are calling it a desperate attempt to distract voters as the country faces record high prices and inflation. Aisha Hosni is live on Capitol Hill. There's a long way to go, Aisha, between uh, the deal that they announced and actual uh, passage of a bill. But they're Absolutely. much closer than they've ever been, Aisha. Absolutely. I would point out that we still don't know where Senator um, Cinema stands, and we have a few senators, Democratic senators, that are out with COVID. They need all of them to be here in person to vote on this if they bring it to the floor. I got to tell you, this surprise deal really stunned all of Washington last night. Democrats, Republicans alike, who thought uh, really any part of President Biden's social spending agenda was practically dead. Instead, what we now found out is that behind the scenes, Senator Manchin and 
leader Schumer had been negotiating on this deal quietly all along, and now they've got this new energy tax and drug deal that's expected to cost a whopping $740 billion. They say that this will be able to reduce the deficit by $300 billion by increasing the corporate tax rate, reforming prescription drug prices, and increasing IRS enforcement. But the deal will also invest a whopping $369 billion in energy security and climate change provisions. Now, Dana, it looks like Schumer and Manchin may have pulled a fast one over Leader McConnell here. The deal came just mere hours after the Senate passed the CHIPS Plus bill, something that McConnell had previously said he would not support had Democrats tried to move ahead with any parts of Build Back Better. But House Republicans, Republicans are now whipping very hard against that CHIPS Plus bill. In fact, we're expecting Leader McCarthy on the floor in the next hour as Republicans slam this new deal. They say that spending will only worsen sky-high inflation. Senator Cornyn saying Senate Democrats can change the name of Build Back Broke as many times as they want. It won't be any less devastating to American families and small businesses. And here's uh, Senator Cotton uh, last night. Joe Manchin's 700-page trillion-dollar tax and spend bill is probably the longest suicide note in the history of West Virginia. What do the Democrats now propose to do? To spend hundreds of billions of dollars more to sick the IRS on hardworking American families. It's only going to drive up inflation more and cost people their jobs. Dana, all of this tension will be on full display at the congressional baseball game tonight. Dana? Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> Watching that. Thanks, Aisha. It's all good to go. Um, Play again. You bet. We just found out that President Biden is apparently going to speak about this reconciliation deal. You know, the, the Democrats call it the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of questions about that. But something that Aisha just said is very interesting, Bill. So the Democrats think this is clever, right? They had a chips bill. They were able to get that That's done. Right. Um, but now they've tried to pull a fast one. Mm -hmm. So they might not get chips or reconciliation right. at the end of the day. Within hours, they tried to pull a fast one, too. Um, a lot of the obsession on the climate you can find at the heart of what Joe Biden's presidency has been for the past year and a half. Um, on the New York Times poll, however, the American people are not on the same page. I mean, he, here are the numbers. Do you think the climate is the most important problem facing the country? Total voters, that's 1%. <laughs> Total, but Democrats right. at three percent. And you look at the uh, look at the headlines too about this. That um, it will say the the most spending on climate change ever. Uh -huh. It'll be historic and it will be huge. And you know what? They'll ask for more in three months. Uh, likely. Yes. But all this is being. The incentives are coming from your tax dollars to go out and buy an electric vehicle. It's coming out of Washington. It's in California. You're going to find out it's in New Jersey in 30 minutes when we do a segment on that. Yeah. All this is being financed by Washington. Charles Payne earlier today said, if it's such a good idea, why do you have to give yeah. incentives? To go out and buy it. The last Fair thing question. I'll point on, out on this is that Jake Sherman of Punchbowl News, he's a reporter there mm -hmm. in D.C., said that the Senate Democrats have barred reporters from staking out the room where they are discussing this very reconciliation <laughs> deal in which a lot of your taxpayers would be paid. Oh. So that's all mm -hmm. happening as well. We've got. Meantime, we've got bad news for the big guy. The New York Post revealing President Biden may have had a much larger role in Hunter's business dealings than he's been letting on. Chris Rock finally breaking his silence and the Oscar slap heard around the world. Wait to hear what he said. Clay Travis from Outkick.com. Digital reporting that President Biden met with at least 14 of Hunter's business associates while he was vice president. Now, the New York Post taking aim with today's front page. The paper reports that Hunter's business partner referred to President Biden as, quote, the big guy. Griff Jenkins live in Washington with the details. Good morning, Griff. Good morning, Dana. The identity of the big guy has been the subject of much speculation as part of the ongoing grand jury probe into Hunter Biden's dealings. Now, according to the New York Post, one of Hunter's business partners named James Gilliar appears to have referred to Joe Biden as the big guy in a message on the same day the Post broke the news of the infamous laptop left behind by the president's son. Now, this comes as a Fox News digital review shows at least 14 of Hunter Biden's business associates met with then Vice President Biden, ranging from Mexican billionaires to a former Colombian president to Ukrainian and Russian energy executives. Yet Biden consistently denies it. Mr. Vice President, how many times have you ever spoken to your son about his overseas business dealings? I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. I have never discussed with my son or my brother or anyone else anything having to do with their businesses, period. 
Meanwhile, the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee says multiple FBI whistleblowers allege senior FBI and DOJ officials tampered with politically sensitive investigations across multiple election cycles, including queries into Hunter Biden's dealings. Grassley had this to say to you guys yesterday. They wanted to characterize it as disinformation, and they shut that investigation down. Now, this is hurting the credibility of the FBI. People ought to have ultimate confidence in the FBI. And as a result, now Grassley and Senator Ron Johnson are demanding the DOJ open an internal investigation or appoint a special counsel. The DOJ has declined to comment. Dana? Thank you, Griff. Joining us now, OutKick.com founder Clay Travis. Hello to you. Nice to see you in person as always. Good to see you guys good, always good as well. Good to get you out of that attic from Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee, right? Uh, so we're reporting 14 meetings with Hunter uh, Biden's business partners, uh, while VP. In 2014, he had contact with a vice president photographer yes. asking for a picture of the meeting that was held with the big guy. Here's what I think should happen, guys. They should go back. All of those Pulitzer Prizes that the New York Times and the Washington Post got for Russiagate should all go to the New York Post <laughs> for their coverage of the Hunter Biden laptop. Because Miranda Devine and company, for people who have followed that, she wrote an entire book about it. Everyone else, years later, is now saying, oh, by the way, everything that they reported was accurate. And uh, for Joe Biden to be able to slide, big picture, what we've been talking about on the radio show is it feels like Democrats are done defending Biden. Obviously, the argument over whether we're in a recession, we know we're at 40-year high inflation. It's not a way he's going to be able to run. No way. And so I feel like Democrats are starting to push him off the stage and they're not protecting him like they were in 2020. I don't know if you guys agree, but that seems to be the big picture story here of what's going on. I think it's um, I, I think it's very interesting. And especially when you look at some of these polls where 75 percent of Democrats say right. they don't want him to run again and they'll need a reason to say, let's you know, cut. And ties. I think Hunter is it. Here is what I said on the show, uh, the radio show the other day. And this is my big uh, buck. Uh, my co-host says this is like back to back Babe Ruth home run uh, shots. We can add this to okay. Dana does sports if it works. <laughs> uh, I think that Hunter Biden's going to get charged. I think that Hunter Biden is going to get charged and then they're going to try to use Hunter Biden being charged as cover to be able to yeah. charge Trump with a conspiracy. Oh. Because then Merrick Garland comes out and says, it doesn't matter if you're the president's son, it doesn't matter if you're the former president, we are going to pursue truth and justice wherever it leads. And so I think this is all leading up to that. That's my My, big, my, big my sense is on the whole re-election thing, it seems to me as if the more the left tries to push him off the stage, the more defiant yeah. he becomes. Well, I, I think you're right. And he is. How often have we seen, Danny, you especially have to look at this and just throw your hands up as somebody who worked in the White House in communications. How often does the White House come out and say, oh, Joe Biden didn't mean what he yeah. said? And there have been reports that privately he said, I'm the president. I, I mean what say I that. say. Yeah. And, and to your point, I feel like Trump and Biden are kind of like boxers late in a boxing match who are both holding each other up because the Democrats may well think Biden's the only guy that can beat Trump, and Trump wants to get in that ring against Joe Biden again desperately. But what happens with these DOJ investigations kind of in every different direction? Uh, what's going to end up shaking out? I'm fascinated to see as we Do move Do you think that President the Biden then would try to pardon his son? I think he would. It's his only living son. And I think that's the I think that's the way they force him out, really, is he does that. And I think by February or March, I really do believe that Biden is going to have to announce that he's not going to seek re-election after well, we, the shellac. We, we shall see. But I mean, that's a lot of predictions I just hit you guys. <laughs> came, came out of the basement. Well, and, we uh, the, we the noted them all down, and yeah. we will get back to you. So you've got two heavyweights leaning on each yes. other. Waiting for the bell. That's right. Can we hang on long enough? That's to the end for of people round. out there who watch boxing matches, you know what that's like 10, 11, round 12, when both guys have punched themselves out and they're exhausted and they're just kind of yeah. in the ring and it feels like they're the only I, I would just like the record to show up. that you guys use a lot <laughs> yeah, of did. sports <laughs> analogies today and I kept up. Hey, and I'm headed out to <laughs> tee like, out, uh, yeah. tee off with the live tour right yeah. now to Bedminster. Well, so we'll bring see. us back a story. I hope I'm going to break 100. 
That's, I heard that's a tough course. Is that good or bad? That's not good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not good golfer, Dave. Good to have you here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, the first time in more than a decade, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas will not be teaching law students at George Washington University. Is another school caving?